This is the two minute warning. Please press one to ask a question. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining today's update on COVID-19 in North Carolina. As of today, we have had 532,830 total cases, 8,551 new cases reported, 3,339 people in the hospital, and sadly, 6,729 who have died. Our prayers are with those who've lost loved ones this year and who are fighting this cruel disease. Although overall testing was down as expected during the Christmas holidays, we saw the highest number of people in the hospital and record high percent positives. Keeping people from getting sick and having to check into hospitals, that's an urgent priority. Right now I'm asking every North Carolinian to double down on our prevention efforts and protect each other by wearing a mask, being responsible, following the protocols, and making good decisions. The latest recommendations from the White House Coronavirus Task Force offer stark warnings for those over 65 years old or with an underlying health condition. The task force cautions that these people should not enter any indoor space where people aren't wearing masks and recommends having groceries and medicines delivered to avoid exposure. That's a lot. The recommendation stresses that gatherings of people not wearing masks, public or private, simply are not safe. That's how prevalent this virus is right now. We must take these recommendations from the White House and all safety precautions seriously. As our fatality numbers show starkly, this is a matter of life or death. As this pandemic continues to take lives and livelihoods, many people are struggling to make ends meet. Financial challenges are difficult at any time, but especially during the holidays. In an effort to ease some of that burden, I have signed an executive order to extend the state's eviction moratorium through January 31st of 2021. 
Too many families are living on the edge, trying to do the right thing, but left with impossible choices. This order will help them stay in their homes, which is essential to slowing the spread of the virus. Earlier this year, my administration created the HOPE program to help both renters struggling to make ends meet and landlords who depend on income. This program provides payments directly to landlords and utility companies, and over 21,000 renters so far have been notified that they're going to receive help amounting to $37.4 million. The overwhelming need for this assistance versus the money that we had meant the program had to stop taking applications. But fortunately, help from Washington is finally on the way, and we look forward to opening it back up. Over the weekend, the President signed legislation that provides funding for vaccine distribution, schools, direct payments to individuals, help for small businesses and hospitals. It includes a badly needed extension of federal unemployment assistance and direct payments to families that qualify. The federal package also includes funding specifically for rental assistance, and we expect North Carolina to receive about $700 million for that purpose. When North Carolina receives these resources, I plan to work with the General Assembly to help disperse it quickly and effectively. As we move ahead with getting this support to those who need it, we must not lose sight of our primary goal, preventing the spread of COVID-19 so we can save lives and revitalize our economy. We have to protect ourselves and each other every day, every week, every month. The vaccines offer hope, but this hope will take time to fulfill. We continue to distribute the vaccines across the state as quickly as we get them. We remain in the first phase, 1A, vaccinating frontline health care workers and staff and residents of our nursing home programs and long-term care settings. Our hospitals and local health departments are working hard to get vaccine to people. There's a lot we have to do, including following the state's rules on the order of priority. It's a lot they have to do to do that, to follow those rules. Secretary Cohen and I have asked leaders from the state's clinical boards and associations to provide us with recommendations on the best way to enforce those vaccine priority rules. Now I'm going to ask Dr. Mandy Cohen, our Secretary of the Health, Department of Health and Human Services, to share an update on our data and on our vaccine efforts. Dr. Cohen. Thank you, Governor. This will be our last press briefing of 2020, and it's hard to believe that we've held more than 110 pandemic briefings this year. You've all heard me say the three W's a lot. And as I reflect on this past year, you know, look, it's been incredibly challenging, but I'm also so proud of our state. All across North Carolina, people have been coming together to protect one another and save lives. And while there's still so much to do, we head into 2021 with a powerful tool to stop this pandemic, vaccines. Today, I'm going to walk through the new phases of North Carolina's vaccine plan. Based on new federal recommendations that were just issued last week by the CDC Prevention's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP, we have updated and simplified the state's vaccination prioritization plan. First, I just want to share some important information about vaccines in general. We have been very fortunate that scientists had a head start. The vaccines that are now available were built upon years of work in developing vaccines for similar viruses. All vaccines are regular, rigorously tested for safety and effectiveness, and more than 70,000 people volunteered in clinical trials right here in North Carolina as well for the two vaccines now available to make sure they were safe and work to prevent COVID-19. To date, both vaccines that are currently available are 95% effective in preventing COVID-19. There were no serious safety concerns in the clinical trials with either vaccine. You could have temporary reactions like a sore arm or headache or feel tired and achy for a day or two, but you cannot get COVID-19 from the vaccine. Vaccines will be available to everyone, but currently supplies are limited. 
and will continue to be limited for the next few months. Therefore, states must make vaccines available in phases. You'll see as I go through the phases that everyone has a spot to take their shot. To save lives and slow the spread of COVID-19, the first phases focus on protecting healthcare workers caring for patients with COVID-19, protecting people who are at the highest risk of being hospitalized or dying, and protecting those at highest risk of exposure to COVID-19. So right now, we're currently in that first phase, phase 1A. Most of our hospitals received their first shipment of vaccine less than two weeks ago. Local health departments started receiving vaccine doses just last week, a few days just before Christmas. Together, they are vaccinating healthcare workers caring for and working directly with patients with COVID-19, as well as those giving vaccines. The early data suggests that there is still work to be done to be sure that vaccines are administered, equ administered equitably. Understandably, communities who have faced long-standing and continuing racial and ethnic injustice in our healthcare system may feel greater distrust towards vaccines. We are partnering with trusted community leaders and organizations to provide accurate information to all North Carolinians and also with our vaccine providers to ensure equitable access to vaccines. Long-term care residents and staff are also being vaccinated right now. The federal government is overseeing that long-term care vaccination through a partnership with Walgreens and CVS. This effort began on Monday and data is not yet included in our vaccine dashboard. We anticipate moving to the next phase, phase 1B, in early January. Currently, there is not enough vaccine for everyone in phase 1B to be vaccinated at the same time. To best manage vaccine availability, we will open phase 1B in groups. We will add additional groups from phase 1B over the month of January, one at a time. Vaccines will first open to group one, which is anyone 75 years or older, regardless of medical condition or living situation. In group two, it's our healthcare workers and frontline essential workers who are 50 years or older. They'll be added in next. This group will be followed by group three, which are healthcare and other frontline workers of any age. Just like the previous phase, the groups in phase two will begin one at a time. Vaccines in phase two will open first to anyone ages 65 through 74, regardless of medical condition or living situation. Next, we'll come to anyone 16 to 64 with a medical condition that increases the risk of severe disease from COVID. They'll be followed by anyone who's incarcerated or in a group setting um, that has not already been vaccinated because uh, they're a part of an earlier phase or group due to their age, medical condition, or job function. Then vaccines will open to other essential workers as defined by the CDC who have not yet been vaccinated. In phase three, college, university, and high school students 16 or older will be vaccinated. Younger children will be vaccinated when the vaccine is approved for them. It is not currently. And in phase four, that's when anyone else who wants a COVID-19 vaccine can get one. But remember, with the limited supply of vaccine, we think this could be well into the spring. Okay, that was a lot to cover. All of these details are now outlined on our new vaccine webpage, yourspotyourshot.nc.gov. Your shot, your spot, sorry, your spot, your shot, nc.gov. As we head into 2021, the vaccine is a powerful tool, but we also head into the new year in a very dangerous position. We are setting records for the percent of tests that are positive. We've been at 14% for the past several days. Hospitalizations are alarming with record numbers in the hospital and record numbers in the intensive care unit. I'm very, very worried and talking regularly with our hospital leaders. The spread is so critical that the White House Coronavirus Task Force has issued stark warnings to North Carolina this week. If you are under the age of 40 and you gathered beyond your immediate household, you need to assume you became infected with COVID even if you don't have any symptoms. 
The task force warns that if you, you are dangerous to others and must isolate away from anyone at increased risk for severe disease and get yourself tested. As the governor mentioned, the White House task force report also says that if you are over 65 or you have significant health conditions, you should not enter any indoor public spaces where anyone is unmasked and you could, should have your groceries and medications delivered. We all have a responsibility. Be sure you are always wearing a mask. If you are with someone that you do not live with, you need to wear a mask over your mouth and your nose. Wait six feet apart and avoid gathering with people outside of your household. If you must, keep it small, keep it outside, and always wear a mask. Wash your hands often throughout the day. Wear, wait, and wash are three W's. And whatever your reason, get behind the mask. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Using the guidance from independent federal and state advisory committees, North Carolina continues to work to get this vaccine to people as quickly as possible. The vaccine, along with more funding from the federal government, have provided a glimmer of hope at the end of a long year. When we rang in 2020, we didn't expect to be closing it out in the grips of a global pandemic, but here we are. And we have to seize our resolve and make it last. We've learned a great deal about how to combat COVID-19 since this virus emerged, but we also learned a lot about our communities and ourselves. Let's live up to our ideals by doing what we know works. Wear a mask, practice social distancing, avoid gatherings where the virus can be spread easily. And remember, this New Year's Eve, we still have a modified stay-at-home order in place from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Our collective New Year's resolution should be keeping each other safe in 2021. Most North Carolinians worked hard to care for one another in 2020. Let's continue those efforts and keep that spirit going as we turn the page on a new year and prepare to turn the corner on this pandemic. Also with me today is our Secretary of Public Safety, Eric Hooks. Department of Emergency Management Chief of Staff Will Ray, and Pryor Gibson, Assistant Secretary of Commerce for the Division of Employment Security. Monica McGee and David Payne are our sign language interpreters, and Jackie and Jasmine Mativier are our Spanish language interpreters. We'll now take questions from the media, and if you could give us your name and your organization, we would appreciate it. We'll take the first question. Our first question is from Richard Craver with the Winston-Salem Journal. Yes, yeah, so Governor, this is Richard Craver with the Winston-Salem Journal. Uh, I had one question for yourself and then one question for Secretary Cohen. Um, the first question kind of focuses on the, the issue of the vaccination. I know that y'all are trying to put out the numbers in terms of how much y'all expect to receive, how much you're actually dis distributing, but can you kind of give us an update of where that stands, I guess, as of the day? And then with uh, Secretary Cohen, um, hey. is there any update or in terms of your negotiations or discussions with Cornell Innovations? Excuse me, Innovations about the letter and text hey. from the six counties looking hey, for Richard. the parking permit. Richard. Very hard for us to hear you. Your, your voice is muffled. Uh, can you can you try it again and just ask me that first question again? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, ah, that first works. of all, I, I was, uh, okay, I was wanting to find out um, where things stand or an update about where the um, expectation for the, the doses from both Pfizer and um, Moderna are at this point. And then I was also going to ask Secretary Cohen about if she had an update on where discussions stand involved with uh, Cardinal Innovations in the six counties that are looking to uh, leave Cardinal. So we have the Pfizer vaccine that has begun to come in and we distributed that to hospitals. The Moderna vaccine came in uh, a week later and we've used that uh, to begin distributing to nursing homes, long-term care facilities and staff because there are less issues to deal with regarding uh, the preservation of it and the handling of it. But I'll let Dr. Cohen uh, address that and the other question. 
Hi, Richard. The governor is exactly right. So we continue to get a weekly allocation of both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. Um, the the allocations that we got the first couple of weeks are, are definitely lower as we go forward. We think we'll be getting about 60,000 doses of each of the vaccine, give or take, um, as we go forward. Remember, some of those need to be used for our long-term care vaccination program. The rest are being distributed between our hospitals and our local health departments as we move from this one, phase 1A into 1B. Um, and then we will expand to other providers as we get uh, into January. As far as Cardinal Innovations, yes, our, our um, department continues to work through uh, the process of, of folks who have asked us to disengage with Cardinal. Um, I know our teams are reviewing that information, and I don't have any further update. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question is from Michael Highland with CBS 17. Hi, good afternoon. This is Michael Highland from CBS 17. Uh, I want to ask first about the updated list you all just went over for um, distributing the vaccine. Uh, a couple questions related to that. How are you defining who an essential worker is and why are people who are incarcerated uh, prioritized where they are, including above uh, students and the general public? Well, first, we have relied heavily on the CDC advisory committee uh, recommendations, and they just recently changed in the last couple of weeks. Uh, they began looking at the statistics of who was getting sick and dying, and age was a factor that was pretty significant that affected whether people would get really sick and die. Age is also a much easier thing to, to be able to tell about somebody rather than whether a person has a lot of chronic problems or not. So they uh, put in this new advice based upon people's age, and our people looked at it. We, our state advisory committee looked at it, and ours follows pretty closely what the CDC recommendation is. And our definition of essential workers uh, follows pretty closely what the CDC says. Uh, we know that uh, people who are incarcerated, that the risk is significantly higher in congregate care facilities. Uh, people by age in, in uh, our prisons will get vaccine just as other people reach that age uh, spot. Uh, but then uh, it comes in in the second part of, uh, of phase two, and I'll let uh, Dr. Cohen address that uh, even more. Dr. Cohen. Thanks, Governor. Hi, Michael. So two things to point out. Um, at, in the phases, you need to make the distinction between frontline essential workers and then other essential workers. In phase 1B, we, we do open to frontline essential workers, and that is defined by the CDC. You can find that um, on our, our website now. This information is there, um, so you can know what categories of folks. They are frontline folks like firefighters, police officers, um, our K-12 teachers, uh, um, those who are working in child care, U.S. Postal Service. Those are the categories that are in frontline essential workers. Then there is another bucket of essential workers that is captured in phase two, also uh, defined by uh, the CDC. Um, so I'd encourage folks to go look for the details there. Um, and yes, as the governor mentioned, related to incarcerated populations or any populations living in congregate setting, there is a higher uh, risk of viral transmission in those settings. We want to make sure that folks have access to that vaccine, whether they fall into that category because of their age. So if you are uh, in, in a congregate setting and you're over 75, you'll be prioritized uh, for a vaccine or by job or when we get to age of 65 to, to 74. And if you're not picked up um, in those or because of medical status, then that is when you would get picked up in our phase two uh, grouping of those who live in other congregate settings. Thank you. Next question, please. Okay. 
We'll hang on for one minute to wait till they reconnect with the uh, questioning. I'll also mention while uh, we're waiting for the line to get hooked back up that this is a complex process of preparing the vaccines and getting people trained on how to administer it. And we are just into this uh, a couple of weeks and we ask people to be as patient as you can with your health department officials and your hospital workers. These are people who have been fighting this battle now since March. And it's a workforce that has been strained, that has been working hard uh, day in, day out. And now they have this logistical issue of being able, ha having to make sure that people get vaccinated with a complex process. People with Pfizer need to get vaccinated and then vaccinated again 21 days later. Moderna vaccinated and 28 days later. So just be patient with them as they're working to get their logistics started on the ground. Uh, we're trying to provide them with as much support as we can and look forward to continuing to work with our health departments and our hospitals uh, to get this vaccine, vaccine out as quickly as we, we possibly can. I think we are reconnected. Our next question is from Laura Leslie with WRAL. Laura, are you on the line? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, yes, I needed a follow-up to my previous question there. Um, so does the state or the federal government need to take a more active Um, I'm wondering, I know they're going to hospitals, to health departments, to these, uh, you know, facilities via the federal program, but it seems to people who are sitting around waiting for these shots that it's moving at a glacial pace. Thank you. So we didn't hear all of your question, Laura, but I think it had to do with the speed of the vaccines. And remember that they've been delivered to us about two weeks ago and we have directed that they go to hospitals first and uh, also directed that they go to CVS and Walgreens that are in administering this program on behalf of the federal government at our long-term uh, nursing homes, long-term care facilities and staff. But I'll also let uh, Dr. Cohen address the issue of speed of vaccinations. Hi, Laura. I think everyone across the state that is working on vaccine administration wants to make sure we can get vaccine to people that need it as quickly as possible. As the governor mentioned, it has been less than two weeks since we've had vaccine here in, in North Carolina. The majority of hospitals uh, got those vaccines two weeks from tomorrow. And like I said, some of our local health departments did not receive their first round of uh, delivery until last Wednesday, the day before Christmas Eve. So we know that we are ramping up over the course of this week and we will move into the next phase of vaccinating our 75 year olds and above next week. Um, um, and, the, and the weeks beyond. So I know that there's going to be a maturing of this process as we go forward. It's new for all of us. Um, so we want to make sure that we are tracking appropriately because not, as the governor mentioned, not only are you needing to get that first dose, but you have to come back to get the second one. So it is important that we take the time and the care uh, to make sure that we are um, uh, uh, administering the first dose appropriately and making sure that you have that time to come back for your second dose. Um, so we are going to uh, make sure that we are ramping up and uh, improving our operations as, as we go. Um, but I would, I would remind everyone that there are very limited supplies at this point. As we move into phase 1B, if you think about how large a group that is if, of folks who are over 75 and all of our frontline essential workers. That's, that's, that's more than a million folks. Um, and that is not the number of doses we have uh, here. Um, it could be up to two million people who are in that 
first, uh, first group of, of 1B. Um, so it's going to take some time for us to get vaccine to everyone. Um, I'll echo what the governor said, which is we appreciate everyone being patient um, as we work through this process and just know that these are the same health departments and the same hospitals that right now are are strained with the most number of COVID patients that they've seen throughout this pandemic. And so um, we appreciate everyone's patience. Thanks, next question, please. Our next question is from Laura Lee with Carolina Public Press. Good afternoon, Governor, it's Laura Lee from Carolina Public Press. Um, as we saw, Last week with the atrium distribution, there were some people who were notified that they were eligible when they didn't qualify and they were offered the vaccine. Um, in that process, the hospitals have been permitted to determine their prioritization uh, in terms of deciding who should receive the vaccine um, under your guidelines. And I'm just wondering, as it pertains to the frontline essential workers, um, who is going to make the determination about who will qualify, for example, as a food worker, which is one of the categories, um, and are there safeguards uh, by the state to ensure that, you know, there's fairness and equity in making those determinations? We realize that there aren't absolute precise lines here in describing all of these categories, but we think it's very important that providers and people who are administering this vaccine stick to the priority list. And we're going to be very stern about that, making sure that they do. Uh, Dr. Cohen and I have uh, sent notice to some of the health care licensing boards to talk about what type of uh, discipline could be put into place for providers who uh, do not abide by this priority system. We think that is extremely important for people to do, and we've done because we've done it for a reason. But I also want Dr. Cohen to comment about this. Hi, Laura. Well, first, I want to say that we keep reiterating we're, we're two weeks into this. I think folks are learning about the parameters of our guidance. When we heard about the atrium situation, our team reached out to their leadership team. They're very receptive and uh, adjusted their process uh, going forward, which we appreciated. Um, and so we are very serious about folks following the state's priority prioritization. We are updating it today. So now folks have clear guidance from us going forward. Um, and we have asked whether it was the nursing board, the medical board, our pharmacy board, our dental board to meet with them and as well as their corresponding associations to make recommendations back to us about enforcement. We can't have folks um, jumping the line and having their family members or friends, board members, donors jumping the line, and, and importantly, cannot see folks profiting financially. These vaccines are free. They are meant to be free for those who are getting that vaccine. And if we see folks who are uh, trying to profit financially from that, that, that will not be tolerated. So we look forward to the recommendations back from, from those boards uh, so that we all are just playing by the same rules across our state. Thanks. Next question, please. Follow up, Laura Lee, Carolina Public Press. Thanks for that, um, Governor. As to the healthcare workers, I'm still curious though about uh, essential frontline essential workers that are over 50. And so, if we're looking at things that um, you know perhaps are a bit more subjective, for example, postal workers. You know, whether or not you work at a post office is uh, a pretty ob objective thing to define. But things like grocery stores, how the, how a grocery store will be defined how a worker at a grocery store who's considered frontline will be defined. Are those decisions that you anticipate will be made by the businesses themselves, or will there, there be state either guidelines or requirements um, in terms of assessing who, what individuals in those frontline positions will be given vaccine? As this process uh, unfolds operationally on the ground, I know that we will be making some decisions and adjustments as we go because, yes, there are difficult decisions that are going to have to be made at the local level. We want them to stay within the guidelines as much as they possibly can. We'll provide help in providing descriptions to them as to precisely who fits into the category. 
But these are broad categories, and there are going to have to be some decisions made at the local level by people administering these vaccines as to whether someone falls into the category or not. And uh, that's just something that we know is going to happen because it cannot be perfect and precise. Dr. Cohen, she says that covers it. Thanks. Next question. Our next question comes from Garrett Berkowitz, Berkowitz with Spectrum News. Good afternoon, uh, Governor and uh, Dr. Cohen. Uh, Dr. Cohen, you mentioned earlier the issue of equity in distributing these vaccines. And uh, I apologize if someone already asked this while we were having some phone issues earlier. Uh, looking over your initial vaccination data, uh, the initial data show that about 80 percent of those who have uh, were vaccinated are white and about 60 percent are in that uh, 25 to I believe 49 age range uh, what's going on there uh, and what sort of efforts do you have underway to uh, try to bring those numbers a little bit more in line with uh, North Carolina's demographics as a whole Garrett, thanks so much. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, I think there is work to do here to make sure that we are distributing vaccines equitably. There's a unfortunate longstanding history of racial and um, uh, injustice that is built into our medical system. And we need to make sure that we are proactively trying to overcome that from the beginning. As we look at our early data, I would caution everyone to recognize that that is just a, a, a week's worth of data at this point. Um, but I think there is definitely work to do to make sure that we are um, getting that equitable distribution. That is why we are working closely with partners that are community-based organizations from our historically marginalized populations, working closely with members of the General Assembly and other leaders um, from the faith community who represent um, communities to make sure they're getting good information about the vaccine so they can make informed decisions for them and their family. Um, we want to make sure folks know that this vaccine is safe. It has been tested in clinical trials. It is effective. It is 95% effective. You cannot get COVID from the vaccine itself. There is only one vaccine for everybody. Um, it is the same vaccine for everyone. Um, there obviously are two kinds, a Pfizer one and a Moderna, but they are the same for everyone. So we want to make sure folks are getting that good information, and we're going to keep um, sharing that good information. But then we also have to work to make with our our trusted partners um, to make sure folks know about the availability of vaccines and when it is their spot in line that they come take their shot. Thanks. Thanks. Next question, please. Our next question is from Don Vaughn with the News and Observer. Hi, Don Vaughn with the News and Observer. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, just what you were saying about spot in line, what's being done to fix the problems that UNC and elsewhere about registering the right people in the right order to get vaccinated when they should? And you mentioned asking the board for discipline options. What can be done now as far as accountability and oversight uh, before these vaccines are given out? to make sure they go in the right order, like say a custodian that works with COVID patients. Yeah, thanks for that. Obviously, we are working to make sure folks understand the guidance, reiterating it in, in um, further and further detail, working with the individual organizations, answering questions, make sure everyone is on the same page. And I will say folks have been very receptive if there is something that we have seen that um, we, we believe is, is not in line with those guidance. Um, they get a call from me or my senior team, and I, I have found folks to be incredibly receptive to then come back into the, the guidelines. So I think every Everyone is trying to do their, their best to stay in this priority order, and that's what we want to keep seeing. But we recognize with anything big effort like this, there are um, opportunities for someone to stray from that, for jumping the line, whether it was a, a family member, a donor, a board member, and particularly concerned about seeing anyone profit financially from this. Um, and that is exactly why we've asked our licensing boards and other associations to look at this. I think they, they have some tools, or we need to be open to the possibility that we need additional authority to make sure that we, we are enforcing these rules. Um, and we will work with the General Assembly to make sure that that, that might be possible. Thank you. Next question, please. Follow up, Don Vaughn, News and Observer. 
Hi, thanks for the follow up. Um, you mentioned working with the General Assembly. Is there any authority that you or, or any state agency has now as far as enforcement of the rules and penalties? You know, depending on what happens and the circumstances of someone breaking this priority list and what happened, there may be some current rules or ethics rules that uh, professionals need to abide by that could be broken uh, with the priority. But I've, ar I've already talked to legislative leaders this morning about this issue and talk with them about the potential of needing some legislative action to allow these boards more authority to enforce these rules. Uh, we're gonna wait to, to get the information back from the licensing boards and the associations to see what their input is and to see if we do need to go to the General Assembly. I think they will be receptive to something that we could come together with to make sure that we have something in place that could, we could enforce. I think it's really important for everybody to stick uh, to this priority list as much as possible. And we, we don't want to see people taking advantage of this because of their position. Next question, please. Our next question is from Claire Donnelly, WFAE. Hi, Governor and Secretary Cohen. Claire Donnelly from WFAE in Charlotte. So, um, Secretary Cohen, could you tell me what exactly you asked Atrium to do? And then what, is, what should these big hospital systems do if they have more vaccine doses than frontline workers to take them? Should they be distributing them to their hospital systems in, or I mean, their hospitals in more rural areas, or what is like kind of what's the alternative? Sure, thanks, Claire. I asked Atrium to follow our guidance, um, and we had a very productive conversation. And I know that they changed their um, uh, some of the internal work that they were doing going forward. And what we've asked if that hospitals have extra doses to also be vaccinating community-based providers that may not be affiliated with them, but are community-based and are still working with COVID patients. So there are certainly outpatient providers, meaning they're not affiliated with a hospital, but still work with COVID patients. We wanna make sure they're getting in to get vaccinated. Now they can get vaccinated through their local health departments, but we're hoping if hospitals have extra doses that they can partner together to do that. We've heard some very collaborative stories where hospitals have said, yeah, you know what, I am done with my 1A providers, what, where, how can I be helpful going next? And they've either transferred those doses to the local health department or have taken on some of the, as I said, outpatient providers, whether it's EMT or EMS workers, home health workers or others. Um, so those partnerships are happening and I love seeing that collaboration across our state. Um, so we don't want vaccine to sit on the shelf. We want to make sure the appropriate folks are getting vaccinated, but it's also why we need to take the step forward into our next next phase, phase 1B, and that will start happening as of next week. And so um, starting next week, we expect um, a number of providers to be able to move into uh, starting to vaccinate those 75 or older. I, I anticipate that most providers actually will move into 1B starting probably the week of January 11th. Um, and I uh, anticipate having more information about how patients or people who are 75 or older can navigate that process uh, by next week. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question is from Hannah Smoot with the Charlotte Observer. Hi, Governor Cooper. This is Hannah Smoot. I, I would just wanted to follow up on those questions that you've already gotten about um, atrium and the hospital following the plan. Have you gotten um, complaints from other big hospitals that you know those hospitals may not be following that plan? And and how many other hospitals have you had those types of conversations with? It's, it's very important that the hospitals follow the priority guidance that our department has put forward. A lot of work and thought has gone into it. Um, I'll let Dr. Cohen address that. Uh, 
Thanks for that. I have conversations with heads of hospitals all of the time, um, and we have heard different reports um, of folks saying folks have strayed from the priority. And if, if we hear that, we immediately get on the phone with folks and remind folks what the priority orders are. I do want to remind everyone, like I said, we're, we're less than two weeks into this. I, I think folks are working in very good faith. They're trying to work fast to get vaccine into uh, folks who are in the priority order. Um, it's not perfect process. If there, uh, things do happen, we make sure to follow up and uh, try to make sure they understand what the guidance was. I think this is exactly why we're trying to be as clear as we can about what the priority groups are going forward. I think we've also tried to simplify the, the priority um, groups as we go forward so it's really um, can be more clear to folks as we go forward and then to uh, have our as I said our associations and licensing boards make some recommendations back to us thank you one other thing I think it's important to point out is that the CDC Advisory Committee had a priority list that was different than what we have today and in fact they changed their priority list only a couple of weeks ago. So we have changed our priority list as well. So I know that hospitals and health departments spent time studying the previous priority list that was later changed. So I think everybody is getting familiar with this new priority list that is in place. And I think everybody is diligent trying to work hard to make sure this thing is done right. Next question, please. Our final question is from Brian Anderson with the Associated Press. Hi, Governor. Hi, Dr. Cohen. Brian Anderson here with the EAP and uh, hopeful to a better 2021 going ahead. Uh, I just wanted to ask sort of about vaccine distribution. It's been my understanding that the Trump administration would provide uh, an allotment number every Tuesday and then the state would have till 8 p.m. Friday to sort of tell the feds where to send them. How many vaccine doses has the state received in weeks three and weeks four uh, for distribution? And I know Dr. Cohen mentioned 60,000 in Pfizer and Moderna to be expected for weeks. Why the slowdown and, and what's been the delay that you'd attribute it to? And then I have one quick follow-up after. Hi, Brian. Um, I'm excited you got the last question of the calendar year here, um, and I think you, you, you have it exactly right in terms of the details. Each week on Tuesdays, we get an allocation amount from the federal government between Tuesday and Friday. We create our, our, our own allocation where we basically need to tell the federal government where should they ship that allocation to. We work with our providers to make sure that they're ready to take on um, additional vaccine. Um, and we, we make sure to balance those doses across our geography. We are trying to balance that by population in the county at this point. So we want to make sure we're having the approximately same number of doses per county population um, and then make sure that we get that distribution. So for example, if we have one county that has three hospitals and one local health department, there's a certain allocation to that county and then we distribute it to the various hospitals and the local health department. Now this isn't a perfect system because of the way the vaccine is packaged. I've said many times before the Pfizer vaccine is packaged in units of two, 975, the Moderna come in packages of 100. It just means that the math can, can't ever be perfect. But what we expect going forward and, and what we have seen this week is that we're getting a, about, and a, again, it, the number's up, up and down a little bit, but essentially about 60,000 Moderna, 60,000 Pfizer vaccines. Sometimes it's 70, sometimes it's a little lower uh, each week going forward. And that's what, what we anticipate through the month of January. Um, so about 120,000 new doses each week. But remember, we then need to make an allocation over to our CVS and Walgreens effort that is, that is uh, vaccinating our long-term care staff and, and residents, and then the rest we use to distribute across the state. Thanks, Brian. Oh, Brian, you had a follow-up? That, that's very helpful. Uh, could you just sort of explain what you attribute the slowdown to? Uh, we know there was we were talking about 100,000 plus doses of Moderna and 80,000 in the first wave of Pfizer. Is this a shipping issue? And I know Virginia, just up north, they provide the numbers in its uh, public-facing dashboard 
on how many uh, it is receiving. Uh, will North Carolina do that as well? Yeah, so a, c- a couple of things. I think this is more of a, you know, again, these are better questions for the federal government in terms of how do they decide on the slightly larger allocations in the first couple of weeks. I, I assume that that is related to the manufacturing and production of this, that they had more produced and, and, and uh, waiting to ship. And then as we get into this more steady state, it's sort of their manufacturing and shipping as they go. But again, I think that's a better question for the federal government related to um, why we started with a, a bit of a higher allocation and now we're kind of at a slightly lower um, uh, allocation as we as we go here. Oh, and then I think the question was, are you going to be sharing um, our allocations week over week? And we'd be happy to share that. But what I would encourage folks to understand is that, you know, th- these, these aren't perfect numbers here either. Remember, there are, there are certain vials and we make some estimates about how many doses we think we get. When that happens in reality, hopefully we get more doses actually out of those vials than, uh, than, than what are shipped to us. So we want to make sure that we are really laser focused on how many doses are administered um, because that is really the number that we are, um, are focused on, which is why that is our priority for our public facing dashboard. Thanks, Brian. Thanks everybody for joining us today and have a happy and safe new year.